Here's a fact about me. I love church jokes, which really often work a lot better in church contexts. They can be really corny, but I also find them humorous, although if you remove them from a church setting, sometimes what makes them clever or funny doesn't really work anymore. But in the spirit of both my minister nerdiness and as someone who loves to laugh, here's a church joke for you for Palm Sunday. There was a little boy who, towards the end of the Lenten season, he'd had a cold, and on Palm Sunday morning, he wasn't feeling much better, and so his parents decided that he would stay home with one of them, and the older sister in the family would go to church with, uh, with mom. And so the sister and mom headed off to church, and when they returned home, the little boy who had stayed home noticed that his sister had in her hand a handful of palms, much like our children processed in with earlier today. And so he said, well, how was church today? And she shook the palms in his face and said, it was wonderful. We had these palms and we waved them and we shouted Hosanna to welcome Jesus. And the little boy became really upset and distraught. And his parents said, what's the matter? And he said, the one Sunday I don't go to church, Jesus shows up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's the end. Just kidding. <laughs> Jesus shows up. You know, those of us who are here today know that Palm Sunday, the story of Palm Sunday, is a remembrance of but one of many occasions on which the physical and embodied Jesus showed up. We know that it is but one of the occasions when Jesus made his presence known to his disciples, but also to the crowds. But it also sets the stage for something else to happen. It is a triumphant entering into the city. It is the beginning of what we call Holy Week as we lead up to Easter. And yet, from the joy and the hosannas of Palm Sunday, what happens that brings us through Holy Week, where there's this shift, where things go wrong pretty quickly? How do we get from the hosannas of Palm Sunday to the heartache of Good Friday in such rapid succession. What's happening in that Palm Sunday scene that brings us from this joyful entry to the betrayal in the garden to Jesus being crucified there on the cross like a common criminal? I think to really understand that, it's important to try to parse out what's happening in this account of Palm Sunday. And the one that Kent read this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew. It's one of four accounts. Each Gospel writer includes a story about Palm Sunday, about the triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem during the Passover festival. And each Gospel account has slightly different emphasis, slightly different things that it includes which I like to think of as the slightly different emphases that that particular gospel writer, that particular author, really wanted to make sure we understood as the readers, as the audience, as the hearers. And for Matthew, what's really important that we understand is that Jesus, everything that Jesus is doing, everything that Jesus says, is the fulfillment of prophecy and scripture that has come before Matthew is really good at citing his sources as a gospel writer. Matthew really wants us to understand that what we see happening in the present moment is a link back to what's come before. So let's try to parse out what's happening in the account that Kent just read. Matthew, this good historian, this good gospel writer citing his sources, starts off this way in this account. He says, When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Matthew begins this scene at the Mount of Olives, which was a place that was known to have significant eschatological, which means pertaining to the end times, the time of judgment and decision-making by God, specific, important eschatological significance, particularly for the prophet Zechariah. And so I don't think 
that what is happening here is that Jesus is saying that this is ushering in the literal end of days, but this is the beginning of ushering in the end of something, right? This is the end of Jesus' earthly life and ministry that we're beginning to witness. Here's what Zechariah says about the Mount of Olives. On that day, God's feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. Zechariah's prophecy is talking about a time when God will stand on this Mount of Olives and make decisions, distinctions, judgment about the people and their faithfulness. And so I don't think that Jesus is telling us that this is the literal end of days by choosing to start this portion of his last week of his life here on the Mount of Olives. And I don't think that's what Matthew is trying to tell us. But I do think there's an incredible significance for the gospel writer in this link. Because Palm Sunday, with all its joy and all its celebration, also is the occasion when things begin to unravel for Jesus. And it does set into motion a chain of events that will lead to distinction and judgment and division. Judgment on the part of the Pharisees and the high priests against Jesus. Judgment on the part of the Romans, the ultimate sort of oppressive empire and power in that time and place. Judgment of the people as they begin to turn against Jesus. The crowd that welcomes him on Palm Sunday begins to dissipate over the course of Holy Week, and eventually many of that crowd turn against Jesus. And so I think this significance of the Mount of Olives calls to mind for us that distinction, that division, and the fact that something big is about to happen for Jesus. Something big is about to happen in his earthly ministry. Something big is about to happen for us as well. And so then the scripture goes on to say that Jesus is coming in on this donkey, right? This is also a reference that comes almost directly from Zechariah as well. Matthew says, offering one of those citations that I was talking about, how Matthew is so good at offering source citations. Matthew says, this happened, this whole business about telling the disciples to go get the, the colt and bring it. This happened, Matthew says, to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is a passage that's almost directly Zechariah 9.9. 9. I have them here together for you to be able to see how closely the two parallel. This is a section of prophecy that foretells the coming of the ruler of God's people. Here's the verse directly from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The distinction that's being made here about the Messiah riding in on a donkey, which both the ancient prophecy foretells and Jesus does, is a really important one. I think it's important for us to understand because it helps to understand, I think, how the people began to not quite understand the message of Jesus. Helps to understand how maybe we could move so quickly from the hosannas to the heartache. You see, in Jesus' time, if a, a ruler, a king, some kind of a powerful person was coming into a neighboring land or country or tribe with the intention of conquering those other people, that ruler would enter that land, that country, that tribal space, riding on a horse, a war horse. That was a way of sending a message to the other people saying, I'm here not in peace, but to bring war. I'm here to conquer you. But in Jesus' time, if a ruler or a leader were coming into a neighboring tribe or country or land with the intention of coming in peace, they would signal that by coming in on a donkey. And so both the ancient prophecy of Zechariah and Jesus' own actions, what we see in the story, tell us that Jesus is making this choice to enter the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. 
that Jesus is making the choice to come in peace, not to conquer with a sword, not to overthrow the Romans with war, not to rally the people up to overthrow them forcefully. Instead, Jesus is coming on a donkey. Jesus' revolution is not a revolution of physical or brute force. Jesus' revolution is a revolution of love, one that works to overthrow powers of oppression, iniquity, injustice, by empowering each of us. Jesus' revolution works on love, It works to empower each one of us to understand that we are, every single one of us, a uniquely created, divinely breathed into, beloved child of God, of incredible value and incredible worth. That's the message Jesus comes to deliver. And that's a message that was incredibly different than the people would have been receiving from the Pharisees or the high priests who had trapped them within a corrupt religious system of their day, who overtaxed them at the temple, who took advantage of them when they came to fulfill their religious obligations. And it's not the message that they were getting, certainly from the Romans, who were the sort of ultimate symbol of power, empire, and abuse in the ancient world. The Romans would do anything to maintain power over their empire. And if you were one of their small, settled Uh, countries that they had conquered, which uh, ancient Israel was, the feeling that you had value and worth was certainly not something that they were instilling in you. So Jesus comes into the city on a donkey to bring about this revolution of empowering the people not to take up the sword, but to rise up in love. So, Jesus tells the disciples to go and get him the donkey, and from there, what unfolds is the sort of Palm Sunday scene that we might carry in our memories or in our imaginations, what we envision, what we reenact with our children when they come in to the sanctuary during the first hymn. Jesus comes into the city. It's crowded with people who are there for the Passover celebration, and he rides in on this donkey, and the people are so excited. They're climbing up in trees. They're cutting down palm branches. They wave them. They place them in the road. They put their their own cloaks in the road, a sign of respect. Because in that day, the roads were dirty, muddy, dusty. Let's be honest, they were also animal poopy. They were. And so it was a sign of respect when someone important or honored was coming along the road to put down your own cloak to cover the street with branches and with cloaks so that the feet of that person's animal didn't have to touch the road. And the people shout out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, as Kent was saying at Step Sitters, Hosanna means save us or deliver us now. Save now. The people were expecting one very specific type of Messiah. They were expecting Jesus to ride into the city and rally them up and overthrow the Romans. And so maybe in that moment right there, we can see the seed sown of how things begin to take such a turn over the rest of the course of Holy Week. The seeds for how we move from the hosannas of this day through the heartache of the betrayal on Monday, Thursday, of the crucifixion on Good Friday, of the loneliness of Holy Saturday. The seeds for all of that are sown right here in the memory, what we call the triumphal entry. Because it certainly was that. It was a triumphal entry. But the understanding of what kind of Messiah the people were expecting, the understanding of what Jesus could do for us, the understanding of how Jesus might help to break apart those power structures of his day, those power structures that exist even in our own day, that understanding, we hadn't quite figured it out. Maybe we're still working on figuring it out. But those of us who have the benefit of thousands of years of hindsight, those of us who know the end of this story, we understand that Jesus was not coming to overthrow the Romans. He was there about something even bigger. He was there about calling each one of us to rise up, to be empowered, to claim the uniquely 
created self that we are, to be able to be God's partners in bringing in a reign of justice and love, equity and peace for this whole world, not only for a corner of the ancient world, but for this whole world. It's easy, in a lot of ways, to get sucked up into the crowd, isn't it? It feels really good. It feels really good to chant and cheer and be part of something when everybody's chanting and cheering and everybody's part of it. That's the excitement of Palm Sunday. It's so easy to get swept up in that. And there's nothing really wrong with it. It's good and right to celebrate. It's good and right to welcome Jesus. But... What about when the crowd begins to drift? What about when the crowd isn't cheering anymore? What about when the hosannas are no longer ringing in the air? What do we do then when our faith calls us to still be standing with Jesus, even when he's standing apart from the crowd later this week? What about when our faith, our God, calls us, compels us to continue to stand on the side of Jesus even when it's against the crowd. The side of Jesus, the Jesus who calls us to create more just structures in which to live and move, more just and equitable religious structures in his day and in ours, more just and equitable economic structures in his day and in ours, more just and and equitable systems of the way that we treat one another so that we can work to really take apart Racism, sexism, heterosexism, transphobia. Jesus is calling us to dismantle those powers of oppression symbolized in this story by the Pharisees, the high priests, the Romans. We can probably think of where we see those powers still at work in our own world today. We see them embodied in economic structures that allow for some of us to get richer and richer while some of us barely survive. We see them in systems that allow for communities to all too easily zone out those kinds of people. We see them in structures that allow for some of us to amass enough wealth to comfortably live and some of us to struggle to, bear, to have a, a roof over our head. We see them in structures that tell us who has value and worth and who is other. We see them in religious organizations that fail to really throw wide open the doors and live this message of Jesus that says, everyone is welcome at the table. Those powers are still at work in our world today, and they want to compel us to put down our palm branches, to let the hosannas drop, to step away from Jesus because he's about to be other himself. He's about to be apart from the crowd. So what do we do when our faith calls us? When the hosannas are no longer ringing in the air? When Jesus is standing alone later this week, what do we do? What do we do about that ancient prophecy? What do we do about the way that we know that Jesus has come in to usher in something different? When the hosannas are quiet, when the palm branches are put aside, when Jesus is alone in the garden, how easy will it be for us to stand with him? As we move from the hosannas of today to the heartache of this week, as we anticipate moving back into the incredible joy of Easter Sunday next week, will we feel empowered in ourselves to stand with Jesus even when he's alone, to stand with Jesus as the crowd deserts him, to stand with Jesus when our faith calls us back. Will we feel empowered to live out that ancient prophecy? Will we have the courage to stand with Jesus boldly and bravely when he's alone? Will we desert too? Or will we have the courage to pick up our palm branches, to stand beside him, to let hosannas ring off of our lips this day and all days, empowered, strong, 
secure in this truth of a revolution of love that is coming, will we have the courage to stand with Jesus even when the crowd is not. Amen.